Today, I have a real treat for you. And her name is Dr. Karen Hammond. She and her husband, who's a reproductive endocrinologist, created an amazing facility and an amazing system to get pregnant easier and in a more cost-effective way. She created a system to help people understand that they can reduce costs in so many different areas. She's going to explain all of it in the podcast, but there's a lot of different areas where you can save money in treatment and also have a much more meaningful experience. It can be much more emotionally rewarding. I know it sounds too good to be true, and there's a lot of these get pregnant quick schemes out there, and I promise you that this is an incredible episode with a person who's so well respected in our field. She's won lots and lots of recognition and awards, and she and her husband have developed this fantastic fertility clinic that can really help you in a very different way. So regardless of what your journey looks like, please take a listen. I think you'll learn a lot. Welcome to Donor Conception Conversations. This is the one podcast created exclusively for people who are planning to use donor conception to build their family or have donor conceived children. I'm your host, Lisa Schumann. I'm an author, a researcher, a therapist, and I'm passionate about donor conception and helping people have a better path to parenthood. And today I am very excited because I get to welcome a colleague and a friend who's doing amazing things out in this world and helping people have a great path to parenthood and save money, believe it or not. So I will tell you a little bit about her and she can also tell you a little bit about herself. This is Dr. Karen Hammond. She is a board-certified nurse practitioner and native of Birmingham, Alabama. She earned three degrees from the University of Alabama at Birmingham and has practiced in reproductive endocrinology and infertility for more than 35 years. A recognized leader in reproductive endocrinology and infertility, she's lectured at numerous local, state, national, and international nursing and medical meetings, has received numerous awards for clinical research, and professional service, and has published extensively in clinical literature. She has worked with fertility advocacy nonprofit organizations for more than three decades also. Her dedication and love for patients is immeasurable, as you will see. In 2018, she established a unique, affordable IVF program to increase access to care for patients needing advanced fertility treatment that has drawn patients to her practice from across the country, and probably the globe, who have deemed her the fertility fairy godmother. I agree. Dr. Hammond is happily married to Nicholas Collado and has three adult stepsons and two adorable rescue cats. She enjoys family time, gardening, cooking, wine, and travel, and fortunately being on this podcast. So thanks for coming today, Karen. Really appreciate having you here. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm really excited to talk with you today and to let other folks know uh, what kind of things we're up to up to down here in Birmingham. So tell me what you're up to and maybe tell the audience a little bit about the story about how you came to develop the program that you've developed, which is really amazing. I am so happy to share this with you. Uh, Back in 1985, I started working in reproductive medicine. You know, the first IVF baby in this country was born not not too much uh, before that time. So IVF and a lot of fertility treatments were actually in their infancy at that point. I've always had a zest for learning, and my passion has always been patient care. Unfortunately, I, I saw that... A lot of times the the pressure to build for a patient to build her family or couples to build their family was just uh, getting to be overwhelming for many people, um, especially financially. And through these years, I've seen so many people borrow money, go into credit card debt, uh, more recently have GoFundMe pages and various fundraisers. And it was just getting harder and harder for me to help these patients cope with the financial burdens of fertility treatment. It seems that along with advances in fertility treatments uh, come advances in the cost of fertility treatments. And I wonder how much of that is really necessary. And if all patients have to go through the same expensive types of health care to achieve their dream of a family. So to that end, I had worked to develop a a program 
that just used very mild stimulation, actually just with the oral medications uh, back in the 90s to help help women that couldn't afford IVF. But unfortunately, the pregnancy rate ended up being about a third the cost, just like the price was a third the cost. And I just didn't think those were good enough numbers. So more time passed and I still had that passion to make fertility treatment more affordable. And about that same time, uh, a device was FDA approved called the InvoCell. And so I thought, what if I can pair a more affordable laboratory aspect of advanced fertility treatment with a more modest ovarian stimulation and see if the pregnancy rate might be as good. So I contacted a colleague here in town and said, hey, I may want to come and work with you. I don't really like the way our field has evolved into things being so expensive and many times cost prohibitive for the majority of patients. Explained to him what I wanted to do and he said, great, when can you start? So I originally uh, practiced uh, with this colleague and friend and unfortunately costs kept going up and I realized that I either need to back up and maybe have a little bit of an early retirement or maybe just do things on my own. So fortunately, my husband is a reproductive endocrinologist and one of my closest friends is an embryologist that I've worked with for about 30 years. The three of us decided to, uh, at our advanced age to open up a brand new practice that was dedicated to meet the needs of couples for whom finances are a distinct obstacle to their being able to at least give it a try to get pregnant. And our goal is to offer advanced treatment at a more affordable cost and still have a good pregnancy rate. And we have achieved that goal and continue to make strides in improving our success rates every day. Amazing. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And such an amazing thing to do. You know, so many people would say, okay, well, you know, I'm heading towards the golden years. It's time to wind down. I'm going to stock away as much, make as much money as I can now. And you kind of went in the opposite direction. You said, okay, I'm going to dive into my dream and help people save money and also help them get pregnant in a, in a successful way. And I know Nick, your husband is such a lovely guy and you, the two of you are so passionate about helping people. It's really incredible. I feel like we live at our dream every day. We had a patient today, a couple of patients, but one in particular that graduated today to her obstetrician uh, just thanked us for giving her the opportunity because she wouldn't have otherwise been able to financially afford to do advanced fertility treatment. And here she is graduating at 12 and a half weeks to her obstetrician today. Mm. Um, Just to be quite honest with you, Lisa, I grew up of very modest means, and I think my brother, who is um, a senior pharmacist at uh, Children's Hospital here in Birmingham, I think he and I turned out just fine. We didn't really know how much, how modest our means were until we were older. And I don't think having a disposable 20 or 30 or 50 or whatever number of thousands of dollars makes people a better or worse parent. I think we turned out just fine. And I I want to help people that can't otherwise give it a try to be able to do advanced treatment by offering an affordable option for them. It's incredible. That's so wonderful. So can you tell people how it works? Really, I mean, I'm I'm so thrilled that you're out there and overjoyed to hear all of this. And I really want people to hear about how this works so they can come visit you and, and learn about this process. Absolutely. So I'll start by talking just a little bit about... Mm-hmm. Our version of in vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization was uh, a term that was kind of coined after the fact, and that literally means in glass. To be honest with you, most people don't use glass instruments in the lab uh, for the most part anymore anyway, but we still stuck with that term in vitro fertilization. Basically, what that boils down to is that a woman's eggs are stimulated, eggs are retrieved. And then sperm and eggs are placed into a dish. Sometimes a a single sperm is injected into an egg. That's ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And then the injected eggs are allowed to grow and incubate for a period of time, generally between three and five days, most commonly five days. And then the best embryo is transferred to the woman's uterus. Uh, During that incubation time, the injected eggs and hopeful embryos are in an incubator in the laboratory. Originally, the first IVF cycles that were ever done in the world were done uh, with no stimulation to the ovaries. 
We didn't have all the modern equipment and technology to be able to do quick lab tests with a very quick turnaround. We didn't have transvaginal ultrasound. We didn't even have laparoscopy at that point. So the women were hospitalized and blood was drawn periodically through an IV site. And then when the LH surge was detected, the a team was assembled to take the patient to the operating room and a little incision about like that across her abdomen was made surgically and the ovary was ovaries were identified and the egg retrieved. When IVF came to this country, it changed a little bit because Dr. Howard Jones said, hey, we use ovarian stimulation medications, the gonadotropins for other types of infertility patients. Why not use it for patients doing IVF as well? That would give us more chances to uh, to find good eggs, find just the right egg. Keep in mind, at this point, we really didn't know exactly what the laboratory standards needed to be, exactly what nutrients there needed to be, exactly what the embryo should look like, um, exactly when the embryo should be transferred, how the embryo should be transferred. So all this time uh, has passed. We've used aggressive stimulation for the ovaries to do IVF. We do know what a good embryo should look like. We do know what kind of culture media uh, the embryo should be grown in. We don't have to change it out every day. But even though all these advances have been made, made over the decades, we've still been kind of stuck in that trap of stimulating ovaries aggressively, looking at the embryos every day to see what's going on. And in my humble opinion, I believe that that can cause financial barriers. Really, we've uh, gone from transferring however many embryos we get to transferring a single good quality embryo. So I've tried to step back and do a much more modest stimulation with IVF in our program. We do a combination of oral and injectable medications. Our average number of eggs we get is four, and most people get one or two embryos to transfer. We do transfer one at a time. We follow all the rules from our professional organizations how many to transfer. So if we're just going to transfer one at a time, why do we need to try to get 15 or 20 or or, or so uh, eggs and hopeful embryos? So it brings down the cost of the medication. It brings down the cost of the monitoring because it doesn't have to be as frequent. And we have brought down the cost in the laboratory. We use this little device right here. It's called an Invacel. Uh, It's kind of the size of a champagne cork, uh, a lucite champagne cork. And it has an inner chamber and an outer chamber. If I open this up, you can see this inner chamber right here has a little tiny hole at the very top of it. And just by twisting it like a box of salt, we can open it up, put culture media in here, and then we take a single sperm and put right in the middle of each egg and put injected eggs in here. Since we're getting fewer eggs, we want to maximize the likelihood of fertilization We top it off with a little sterile oil so there are no air bubbles in here. Close it up, and then it sits on this tiny little throne at the very bottom of the Envacel. Once it's seated like that, we put the top back on, and this will be the incubator for those five days. We put it inside a little retaining device. It looks similar to a diaphragm. It's really flexible and movable, so it conforms to the shape of the woman. This goes inside the retention device. I fold it up like a taco, and this goes in the woman's vagina. So this part back behind the cervix is behind the pubic bone. And actually, the wound can't even feel it once it's in there. It's kind of like a tampon. Once it's in there, you really don't notice it. After we do the retrieval, we do the ICSI, put the injected eggs inside. This goes into her vagina. She goes home, comes back in five days. We open it up just like Christmas morning, see what we've got, and put in the best embryo directly into her uterus. So it's saving money in lots of different areas. Wow. Fantastic. So can you explain some of those areas since, you know, our audience is really not familiar with how, you know, the lab costs so much money in in this process? Absolutely. I tell you that starting a practice, I've actually opened up three practices um, in my career, but starting this and, and being integrally involved in all of the financial aspects as well, I can easily tell you that the most expensive place in the entire practice is the lab. It's the lab equipment and the laboratory personnel. 
you want the best people doing your your lab studies, no matter what, and you want the best equipment, the best air quality. So by using the Invacel, we are able to maximize the use of the equipment, maximize our time efficiency, maximize the patient's involvement, but minimize the extra space that's required to culture multiple embryos from multiple patients over multiple days. And it allows this intimate experience for the patient to be able to carry her embryos. So she's not having to wonder if her embryos that are in her Invacel are visiting with the embryos in the dish in the mm-hmm. next shelf in the incubator. Uh, so we don't have to have as much equipment and we don't have to have as many incubators. It also decreases the cost of storage. Only about 30% of our patients have embryos to freeze, which means you know, freezing embryos, that adds to the cost. Many programs nowadays believe if you do IVF and you do an aggressive stimulation, it's safest and has the best pregnancy rate to freeze all the embryos and come back in a much more natural, more modest cycle to do the transfer. Well, we start out with a much more natural and modest cycle, so it's safe and effective to do an embryo transfer in this cycle. So we're saving on uh, medications, uh, the lab, the monitoring costs, and increasing the patient involvement and saving on uh, embryo cryopreservation fees. Now, one thing that's interesting about the Invacel, many things are interesting, but one in particular that relates to this podcast, Lisa, and and to your direction specifically, is that anything that can be done with in vitro fertilization in the lab can also be done with the Invacel. So if a patient needs to do embryo biopsies to look for aneuploidy, so abnormal embryos, or to look for specific chromosomal disorders or genetic defects to try to to rule those things out. It can also be done with donor eggs and donor sperm. So if we are using donor eggs, for example, the hopeful mom can carry the pregnancy from the very beginning. So from the time that the eggs are warmed and a a single sperm is put into each egg, the injected eggs go right into her body. So the time women don't know if they're pregnant or not, she's going to feel pregnant for those first five days. And, you know, I thought that might be the case, but I hear time and time again how patients love that early connection with their uh, hopeful embryos, that they can talk with them, pray with them, play their favorite music, anything that they normally enjoy doing, they can share that from the very beginning with their embryos. I personally believe it adds some advantage to doing IVF by using Invacel. We call it intravaginal culture as opposed to in vitro fertilization. Same thing, just a matter of where the eggs are and embryos are incubated. But I I think that that personal touch is very beneficial to the embryos and to the patients. But also in the incubator, it's very stationary. I could go in the lab right now and do jumping jacks and it wouldn't even be a ripple in the fluid in a, uh, an IVF dish. We're earthquakes. Uh, you know, women are moving around all the time. And so the embryos acclimate early on to the woman's natural body movements. Similarly with the temperature, we've all seen those movies where women are taking their temperature all the time and saying, oh, it's time, honey, come home from work. It's time for us to do our homework to make our baby. Well, our temperature actually fluctuates all throughout the day. Slowest in the morning, it goes up uh, by about a degree or so later in the day. After we ovulate, our temperature increases by about a degree and then still has some uh, fluctuation throughout the day, depending on our activity. I think that's a good thing for the embryos, too, because in the incubator, it's always a constant temperature, but our temperatures change. So, again, the embryos are able to acclimate to the environment that We plan to put them in five days after the egg retrieval. And you could do that with a gestational carrier also. Absolutely. A gestational carrier. A really cool thing that we can do is for women who need to have a gestational carrier, if there's a female intended parent, the female, even if she doesn't have a uterus, she just has to have a vagina, can still have this Invacel and carry the Invacel. So she can be pregnant for those first five days and carry this Invacel. So many patients that we've used gestational carriers for really cherish those first five days that they were able to feel pregnant and be pregnant, even though they may not even have a uterus. It's fantastic. Those are amazing, amazing stories. 
So just to kind of back up for those of you who are not familiar, so, you know, once you have the egg and the sperm alone, retrieved or provided, you can put them in the imbecile rather than taking them to the lab and culturing them in the lab. So you can put them in the imbecile instead. And so that lab time is not used. What Dr. Hammond is trying to tell us is that that lab time is expensive. And also it's so nice to be able to have it in the person's body, the gestational carrier's body, or if you're a same-sex couple, you can have it in one partner's body. If there's a, a person with a vagina, So there's so many benefits, really, it sounds like. And the other thing uh, I think everyone should just take note of is that there, you know, there's lots of information on the internet and lots of questions people have about all kinds of unusual treatment. And yes, when you are going through a fertility treatment, of course, you are willing to drink snake oil if it's going to get you pregnant. But Dr. Hammond is, you know, one of the leaders in our field and we both are you know, very seasoned and have been around for decades and are very active with our professional organizations. So this imbecile that she's recommending is not just one of these things that you're going to see on the internet that's a, you know, get pregnant quick scheme. This is a very well researched and she and her husband are um, very well respected in our community. And so you're really getting such a gift today by hearing this information from somebody who's, you know, so well known in our field. This is really amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's, it, it is FDA approved. To get something FDA approved is no small feat. Even when there was a national emergency, a, a pandemic to get the COVID vaccine approved, it was fast tracked and it still didn't seem like it, it went at lightning speed. It can take years and years and years uh, to get something FDA approved. It's even harder to get it, get something FDA approved that involves human embryos. And this device, the Invisel, is FDA approved just for this purpose. Once we close up the outer chamber, this little silicon ring that you can see right there makes it airtight. So some of the studies that have been done where they're dropped into really disgusting material, that never gets inside of where uh, the embryos are. So it's safe and sound in a nice warm body temperature environment inside the hopeful mom. And it's, it's just remarkable that we're able to do this and save patients the money to do this. And it's still about a third the cost of traditional IVF. And we think that's a true blessing. There are so many people that you probably know this number, Lisa, but the 90% of women that need advanced fertility treatment do not do it primarily for financial reasons. And I think that's such a sacrilege that people are left out of the opportunity to build their family just because they don't have that disposable tens of thousands of dollars to give, to give something a try. Yeah. It's really a shame. And what about, I mean, this is a harder question. What about people who you might feel they're not the best candidates for imbecile? Who would that be? I mean, do you feel like some people, it wouldn't make sense for them? You know, the only people that I can think of that aren't um, aren't a candidate for an imbecile are people that don't have a vagina. And so a same-sex male couple, they could have their gestational carrier carry the imbecile as well. But there really are no people uh, that, that are not a candidate. You're, somebody's going to have to gestate so they can carry the imbecile just like they can carry a pregnancy. As you mentioned, women that don't have a uterus, it's really special for them uh, when they're the intended mom to be able to to feel pregnant for for those few days. So anybody that can do traditional IVF can can culture embryos in an imbecile. So across the board, really, you feel there's no specific criteria when people come to see you, there's no specific criteria they have to meet in order to use it. That's correct. There are no people that will really recommend culturing in the lab over uh, culturing in an imbecile. Sometimes patients come in and they want to do what their cousin did, or they want to do what their best friend did, or they want to do what worked for them before. We're happy to accommodate those requests, but if we can do something that's just as successful and much more financially feasible, then that's going to be our recommendation. Of course, we treat each patient as an individual and what they want to do and what they hope to do are all put into the equation. We 
We work very closely as a team, every member of our team here, and the patient is the leader of the team. Wow, that's great. And what about for patients who need testing, genetic testing? There's um, some difficulty that they're, they're really looking for. That's a great question. So if the, the patients need uh, to have some kind of genetic testing of the embryos, we can still do the exact same thing. We may want a higher number of eggs, so the woman's ovaries may be stimulated more aggressively if she's using her own eggs, or if if she's using donor eggs from a family member who may have something, we just stimulate the ovaries a little more aggressively. We can still grow the, the injected eggs and hopeful embryos in the Invacel. We just take them out on the fifth day and would biopsy the embryos either that day or the following day. And then once the embryos come back, then you'd put them back into the person. Exactly. GC or so, the patient. That's right. So where we are uh, in the country, as well as most other places, the majority of IVF programs in the United States, the blastomeres, the cells we, we take from a, a biopsied embryo, actually are sent off to a genetics lab. They do the testing on the blastomeres and then notify us of the results. Most of the time, most programs in the U.S. can't get the results back the next day. So we freeze the embryos after they're biopsied. And then once we get the results, we transfer the unaffected embryos. And we have a number of patients that we have taken care of where both the husband and wife are carriers for a genetic disorder. So it increases their likelihood of having an affected child. We have had Lots of patients do that with great success. They grow the embryos in the Invacel. We can either bank them until they have a sufficient number to biopsy, uh, the number that they want, depending on how what their family building goals are, if they just want one child or they hope to have a bigger family. We can bank those embryos and then stimulate her again to get more embryos and then biopsy them all at one time as another cost-saving measure. For some patients that both the the sperm source and the egg source are carriers for a specific genetic, the same specific genetic disorder. We'd like to get maybe eight or 10 embryos uh, to biopsy mm-hmm. just to be cost effective and to maximize the likelihood that we'll have a good embryo or two that's unaffected that we can transfer. I'm assuming that the insurance companies probably love this because it's less expensive. They should love this, but insurance yeah. companies are a little bit slow to change. They may or may not recognize this. Mm -hmm. In Alabama and many other states, the majority of other states in in this country, there's not insurance coverage for IVF. They may not cover the actual device itself, but if they have insurance coverage, they should cover all the other aspects. But again, most people don't have insurance coverage for IVF in this country. There are just a dozen or so mandated states where insurance is required. If, if maternity benefits are, uh, are offered, they should also cover fertility benefits. But there are all kind of little caveats along the way. If they cover one, they should cover the other as well. Mm-hmm. We've not run into any obstacles for the few patients that we have that do have health care insurance that covers, uh, that covers IVF. And it's so nice to be able to say you are going to kind of start this this life with your baby, even if you need to biopsy the embryos, you have this opportunity to kind of gestate a little bit before and then transfer the embryo again. So you're kind of really spending more time with this experience. And I think, you know, for a lot of couples, that's a really nice thing, as you're saying, that you can have this experience of kind of feeling like you're growing, creating this baby in your body rather than creating the baby in the lab. It's, you know, you have this extra emotional attachment to it. Absolutely. The bonding is just, is is just beyond belief that the women get to experience when, when they do intravaginal culture, they bond with the embryos and they're engaging in their favorite activities, except for swimming and taking a tub bath. Those are the, uh, Mm -hmm. nothing else can go in the vagina. It's pretty full with this, with this uh, imbecile and retaining device in there, but otherwise they can enjoy any of their, their normal physical activities. And they do really appreciate that, that bonding experience that they are able to have well before their pregnancy test. I would imagine also for people who you're saying that you really need a vagina, but you don't need a uterus. So if you are, you know, a trans individual, or let's say you've had to have your uterus removed because you've had cancer or there's some other reason, 
it might be so nice to have this experience that you wouldn't otherwise have. Absolutely. There are so many cases like that 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 come to mind. There are some women that are born without uh, a uterus, a Mullerian uh, agenesis, it's called. And that gives them the opportunity to be able to, to feel pregnant and to have that pregnancy inside them, even if it is just for five days. That's amazing, Karen. It's really fantastic. And it's so great that you are helping people emotionally and helping them financially. It's it's really such a gift to everyone. I hope everyone here is listening to this because it's really an incredible thing that you guys are doing there. As we wind down, is there anything else that you feel like we missed or that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I, I think I would just like to impart that uh, it is a gift to us as well. My partners and I are at the point in our, our lives and the point in our career where we know it, it's time to give back. None of the three of us have ever been particularly um, tangible oriented. Uh, we don't want a lake house. We don't want a bigger house. We don't need a fancy sports car. You know, we don't like cleaning the house we've got. So <laughs> we're, uh, we're happy not to have things. Uh, we're downsizing at this point in our lives, but there's nothing better than experience, uh, an experience and the experience to tell somebody that would never have been able to have the opportunity for advanced fertility treatment. Congratulations, you're 12 weeks pregnant and you can go to your obstetrician and I can't wait to meet your baby. It's just the most magnificent thing that I could ever imagine. And it's it's far greater than having the fanciest sports car or anything else tangible that I could think of. I'll share a little personal information that I have three amazing stepsons, but I don't have biological children. And when I realized that it was my divine purpose to help other people build their family instead of having my own biological family, I found that my family is just extended in so many different ways by the children that are produced from our our dedication and and our work and our practice. And it's such a blessing to me to be able to see these dreams come to fruition. That's so sweet, Karen. So wonderful. I'm sure you all out there are really um, touched by what Karen's saying. It's just incredible. And uh, you really are the fertility fairy good mother and also uh, angel to us all, really. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. And on top of it, Karen also runs a donor egg meeting, among many other things, which I didn't mention before. She's so busy. I don't know where you get the energy, but it's it's really fantastic to have you accessible and uh, here on the podcast because so many people are continuing to benefit from all the things that you're doing every day. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's truly my honor. And, and where can people reach you? Our practice is Innovative Fertility Specialist. We're in Birmingham, Alabama. Our website is IFS for Innovative Fertility Specialist, INVO, I-N-V-O, so I-F-S-I-N-V-O dot health. And our telephone number is 205-509-0700. So everyone out there, please listen to this podcast more than once because it's so jam-packed with great information. And reach out to Dr. Hammond anytime. I'm sure she'd love to answer your questions. And you can also reach out to me at familybuilding.net anytime. And please subscribe because that's how we keep going. And you'll always hear about our new episodes. So thanks so much for joining us. And I'll see you next time. Thanks again for having me. I loved my dad, but I was worried all the time about what if the things that led to his suicide, the challenges that led to his suicide, what if they're genetic? And so I was concerned about Mm. that. And my mom would sometimes say things like, you don't have to worry about that, but she wouldn't explain why.